Rachel and her friends Dan and Mary have been an inseparable trio since childhood. Summer camps, hiking in the woods, campfire gatherings, all this was part of their shared memories. Now that they were older, they didn't see each other that often. Work, family, distances, life scattered them to different corners of the country. But this year everything turned out well. The Christmas holidays coincided with a vacation, and the friends decided to spend the weekend in an old hunting lodge that once belonged to Dan's grandfather. The house was located in a deep forest, far from the city, surrounded by snow and silence. Dan assured me that everything you need is there, electricity, gas, even the old fireplace, which was still working fine. The first two days passed quietly. They cooked food, played board games and walked outdoors. The house really turned out to be cozy, although in places it was battered by time. But everyone was a little bothered by strange little things. The creaking of floorboards that sounded like footsteps, the tapping of branches on the window when there was almost no wind, and also a broken walkie-talkie that should have been connected to the generator. On the third day, Rachel woke up to a noise in the kitchen. It was still dark, and only the light of the lantern aimed at the porch slightly illuminated the house. When she got to the door, she saw Dan standing by the window with a strange expression on his face. What are you doing? What is it? She asked, shivering from the cold. I think someone is watching us, he whispered, not taking his eyes off the forest. I saw a glimmer of light between the trees. Rachel frowned, but decided to ignore it. There is always something in the forest that seems strange in the dark. However, her tension began to rise when Mary, who came over later, admitted that she had also heard footsteps outside the cabin last night. Dan, maybe your grandfather had neighbors? What is it? She asked. No, this is his family's territory. The neighbors are miles away. They decided to check out the neighborhood. In the morning, all three of them left the house, dressed in warm clothes, with lanterns and knives that Dan found in an old closet. Soon they came across strange footprints in the snow. They were deep, as if someone was moving slowly, drowning in snowdrifts. But the tracks did not go towards the house, but away from it. Someone was here, Mary whispered, pressing her hands to her chest. Dan tried to distract her by suggesting they go back inside, but the footprints still led them to the old gatehouse where grandfather used to store tools. The lock on the door was torn off. Inside, they found only an empty canister, leftover food and several wet boot prints. Someone obviously lives here, Dan said. When they returned, something had changed. It was too quiet inside the cabin, and the door they had closed behind them was now ajar. Didn't we lock her up? Rachel asked, feeling a chill run down her spine. Dan went inside first. He looked around the rooms, checked the windows, but it looked like no one had been here. Only a small detail. The glass of water on the table was empty, although no one had touched it. Maybe it's just a glitch? He grinned nervously. But as evening approached, the tension only intensified. When the friends gathered around the fireplace to warm up and discuss what to do next, they heard a knock. It was not the sound of branches or the usual noise of the forest. Someone was hitting the wall outside. It's probably an animal, Mary said, but her voice was shaking. Dan took the lantern and went out onto the porch. There was no one outside, but the snow around the cabin was crumpled, as if someone was running in circles. They know we're here, he whispered, returning inside. Later that night, Rachel woke up to a rustle. Someone was walking around the house. She stood up, feeling her heart pounding in her chest. The kitchen light was on, but the figure she saw definitely didn't belong to Dan or Mary. She screamed. Dan and Mary ran in, and the figure disappeared. The three of them were now sitting in the living room, armed with knives and an iron rod that Dan had found in the gatehouse. We'll leave in the morning, he said firmly. But when they opened the door the next morning, their car was broken. The hood was open and the wires were cut. We need to walk, Rachel said. If someone is trying to scare us, we shouldn't stay here.
Dan nodded, but his gaze was fixed on the forest. There, between the trees, something shiny flashed again. They're watching. And Mary and Rachel quickly packed up. Everyone took only the most necessary things. Food, flashlights, knives. It was too dangerous to stay in the cabin. They decided to go in the direction of the highway that Dan had mentioned when talking about the location of the house. It was about a three-hour walk through the forest to the road, but staying here was tantamount to stupidity. Outside, they were immediately enveloped in a piercing cold. The snowfall had stopped, but the frost was getting stronger, and every breath burned my lungs. The forest stood silent, as if frozen, listening to their footsteps. The tracks around the cabin were almost covered with fresh snow, but in some places you could still make out deep boot prints that led in the same direction they were going. They could have left, Mary suggested quietly, but her voice sounded uncertain. Or they're waiting for us somewhere ahead, Dan snapped, looking around. Rachel walked last, constantly turning around. It seemed to her that someone was watching them, but whenever she looked back, there was nothing suspicious. After an hour of walking, they came across something strange. There were traces of a fire in the snow, burnt branches and several things that seemed to belong to them. It was their lantern, the one Rachel had left in the cabin. How did he end up here? She gasped, picking him up. Dan examined the place. He didn't like that their things were taken outside. He found a charred piece of paper among the ashes of the fire. There were several lines written on the paper. They see you. You will not leave. Mary gasped softly, looking at the inscription. This is someone's stupid joke. Rachel tried to calm herself, but her shaking hands betrayed her fear. Or someone is serious, Dan replied calmly. They moved on, trying not to think about the strange find. But now the atmosphere around them has become even more tense. The silence of the forest seemed abnormal. I couldn't even hear the birds. After a while, Dan raised his hand, motioning the others to stop. Listen, he said. At first, nothing was heard, but seconds later it became clearly distinguishable. Someone was walking behind them. The footsteps were slow, measured, and coming closer. Rachel turned around nervously. A figure flashed through the trees in the distance. Hurry up, Dan commanded, grabbing both girls by the arms and practically pushing them forward. They ran, almost without feeling their legs, making their way through snowdrifts. The sound of footsteps behind them grew louder. When they reached a small clearing, a man appeared in front of them. He was wearing a mask, dressed in dark clothes, and holding what looked like a tire iron. Wait, Dan shouted holding the knife out in front of him. But the man did not approach. He just stood there looking at them. Suddenly, a new sound came from behind. A second man appeared behind them. Mary screamed, and Rachel squeezed her hand. What do you need? Rachel screamed. None of them answered. Dan abruptly grabbed a stone from the ground and threw it at one of the attackers, but he dodged. The next second, the first person moved towards them. Let's run! Dan shouted. They rushed towards the dense forest, weaving through the trees. The footsteps of the pursuers grew louder, but soon the distance between them increased. Finally, running out onto a small path, they stopped, trying to catch their breath. We can't just run! Mary gasped. They'll find us anyway. Dan looked around. He noticed an old hunting tower that his grandfather used to use. She stood on a raised platform and seemed to be a safe hiding place. There, he pointed, the trap. They climbed onto the tower and locked the wooden door behind them. Most of the forest was visible from here, but the figure of the pursuers was nowhere to be seen. Did they leave? Rachel whispered. I don't think so, Dan replied, checking the door. Suddenly there was a crash from below. Someone was trying to climb the stairs. Dan rushed to the hatch, behind which there was an entrance. He kicked at it to prevent the pursuer from getting up. We're leaving through the window, 
Stop it, he shouted. They broke the glass and went down the back of the tower. The flight continued, but the forces were no longer enough. Friends knew that the highway was close, but the pursuers did not lag behind. Dan turned around to assess the distance and saw that the masked men had stopped. They just stood at the edge of the forest, as if they weren't going to move any further. It's a trap, he whispered. Dan was carefully examining the masked men. Their immobility looked suspicious, but it gave them a small amount of time. He turned to the girls, wiping the sweat from his forehead. If they've stopped, it means they know something, he whispered. We can't go straight, it's too obvious. But the road, it's already close, Mary objected, her voice trembling. Dan raised his hand, pointing to the right side. We'll turn off, go around the forest. We have a chance to escape. Rachel pressed her lips together and nodded. The decision was logical, but every move was now difficult for them. The adrenaline that kept them on their feet was gradually running out. They began to walk around the field, trying not to make any noise, the sound of branches crunching from behind made everyone freeze. One of the masked men was now walking towards them. He was holding a lantern, and the light picked out their footprints in the snow from the darkness. They're coming for us, Rachel whispered, fighting back tears. Hurry up, Dan nudged her, pointing ahead. They began to move faster, making their way through the thorny bushes. Every step was an effort, every breath was excruciatingly heavy. After a few minutes, the group found themselves on a small hill. From here, the clearing leading to the road was visible. Dan looked down and pointed to the path. Let's run there. There's not much left. But as soon as they took a step, there was a loud crunch in front of them. It was the sound of an alarm. Damn it! Dan screamed, looking around. The masked people knew they were here and set traps. The sound echoed through the forest, attracting attention. Footsteps sounded again from behind. Now not one, but several people were moving towards them. Hurry up, he shouted, pulling Mary by the hand. They took off, leaping over roots and fallen trees. The road was getting closer, but now they realized that they were not in time. There was a high grid in the way, rusting with time. Mary tried to climb over it first, but her jacket got caught on the wire. Help me, she screamed, trying to free herself. Dan rushed to her, helping her to remove the caught fabric. At that moment, Rachel froze when she heard voices from the other side of the grid. There's someone, she shouted, pointing at the headlights. Dan, having freed Mary, turned around abruptly. It really was a car. Someone was approaching the road. This is a chance, he muttered. They jumped over the net and ran to the car. Dan was frantically waving his arms, trying to get attention. Wait, help us. The car stopped. A man with a flashlight got out of it. He was in a policeman's uniform. What's going on here? His voice was stern, but it seemed like salvation. We've been attacked, Rachel shouted. The people, they're behind us. The policeman immediately understood the seriousness of the situation. He pulled out a walkie-talkie and started talking, ordering them to get in the car, but as soon as they took a step forward, a rumble was heard from the other side of the road. The pursuers appeared on the trail. The policeman reacted quickly, pointing a gun at them. Everyone stop! Stop it, he shouted. But instead of obeying, the masked men stopped, only staring at the group. Get in the car, right now, the policeman ordered. Dan, Mary, and Rachel hurried inside. The engine started and the car took off. They drove along the road without looking back. The policeman was talking on the radio, calling for backup. Who are they? What is it? He finally asked. We don't know, Dan replied, breathing heavily. They just showed up and started chasing us. You're in the wrong place, the policeman said grimly. Dan looked at him in disbelief. What do you mean? The policeman didn't say anything, 
Just pressed the gas pedal harder. The headlights illuminated the road, but the forest still looked scary. The lights of the city appeared ahead. It seemed that everything was over. But somewhere in the back seat, Mary noticed a strange detail. A familiar badge glittered in the pocket of the policeman's jacket. It was the same symbol as on the note they found in the forest. She didn't say anything, but she squeezed Dan's hand, letting him know that something was wrong. The car became oppressively quiet. The only sound is the measured noise of the engine and the creaking of tires on the icy road. Mary continued to steal glances at the policeman's pocket, feeling her breathing quicken. She wasn't sure, couldn't explain why this particular badge had caused her anxiety, but the feeling of danger had become almost physical, Dan noticed her agitation and leaned closer, whispering. What? Mary said softly. He's got a badge. The same as on the note. Dan tensed, as if everything inside him froze. He glanced at the rearview mirror, trying to catch the expression on the policeman's face. He looked focused, but there was nothing in his behavior that indicated aggression. Is that for sure? He whispered. Mary just nodded. Rachel, who was sitting next to them, noticed their tension. What's going on? She whispered. Quiet, Dan replied. The car turned onto a less well-lit road. A small point was visible ahead, where there was usually a patrol post. The policeman said, We'll stop here. We need to figure it out. These words sounded strange. Instead of taking them to the department or hospital, he decided to head to this place. When the car stopped, the policeman got out first. He went to the post, leaving the door open. We have to leave, Mary whispered. Wait, Dan replied. But at that moment, another person came out of the building. He was in the same uniform, but there was a bandage with the same symbol on his arm. It's them, Mary whispered. On the count of three, Dan said, grabbing a knife from his pocket. We're running out. The policeman turned around, noticing their movement. What are you doing? What is it? He asked, grabbing his holster. But Dan had already opened the door and rushed out, dragging the girls with him. They ran towards the forest, not thinking about where they were going. The main thing is to stay away from the road and these people. There were screams from behind. The police began to chase them, but the fugitives had the advantage. They knew how to hide in the woods. After a few minutes, they stopped to catch their breath. Dan looked around, checking to see if there were any streetlights nearby. They're, they're not ordinary cops, Rachel said, breathing heavily. Obviously, Dan replied. Mary took out of her pocket the piece of paper they had found earlier. She looked at the symbol carefully and suddenly remembered. It has something to do with this area. My father told me about a group that hunted people here. It was a long time ago. Hunting? Dan asked. They called it cleansing. They kicked out everyone who entered their territory, or worse. Suddenly, everything worked out. Their pursuers, masks, strange traps, and this note. They accidentally invaded where they shouldn't have. Dan looked up. We need to move. You can't stay here. They started walking again, treading carefully through the snow. Every sound now seemed like a potential threat. By morning, the forest had become lighter. They climbed out into a small clearing and saw a road in the distance. This is the way out, Dan said. But as they started to move towards the road, there was a familiar crackling of branches from behind. As they ran towards the road, their legs were barely holding up from fatigue, and their hearts were pounding as if they were ready to break out. With every passing second, it seemed that their pursuers were getting closer. Mary turned around, and in the dim morning light, it seemed to her that one of them had jumped out from behind the trees. Hurry up, Dan shouted, but his voice was already hoarse. The road was closer than they had thought. They jumped to the side of the road, almost losing their balance, and stopped, breathing heavily. At that moment, the headlights of a car appeared on the horizon. It could have been their salvation. Dan frantically waved his arms, 
running out into the middle of the road. The car stopped. It was a truck. A man in dirty clothes, with a tired face, was driving. What happened? What is it? he asked, looking at the group of haggard young men. Help me. We're being chased. Rachel shouted, almost sobbing. The man looked out of the window, peering into the forest. He seemed to sense something was wrong, because he immediately opened the door and waved his hand. Get in the back, quickly. He shouted, I'll get you out of here. They climbed into the back of the truck, which was covered with a tarpaulin. Dan was the last to get inside and closed the tarp so they couldn't be seen. The truck took off, leaving the forest behind. Who are they? The man asked, pressing down on the gas pedal. We don't know, Dan replied, still trying to catch his breath. The masked men, they're hunting us. The man nodded grimly, as if he understood what was being said. People often disappear here, he said after a pause. Locals have been saying for a long time that there are some groups, people who believe that this is their land. Is it legal? Rachel looked shocked. Of course not, the driver replied shortly. But who cares if no one comes back later? You are the rare lucky ones. Mary, still trembling, pressed herself against the side of the truck. She couldn't tell if their terror was over, or if it was just a respite. After driving a few miles, the truck stopped at an old gas station. The man looked out of the cab. I can't go any further. This is already the territory of the city. Call the police if you want, but be careful. He looked at them with a serious look. These people don't forgive. Dan nodded, helping the girls out. The driver muttered something under his breath and drove off, leaving them alone. They entered the gas station building, where there was a small shop. The cashier, an elderly man, looked up in surprise. What happened to you? What is it? He asked, looking at their ragged clothes and frightened faces. We need help, Rachel gasped. We, we were being chased. The man nodded, picked up the phone and started calling the local police department. Soon a patrol car pulled up. This time the officers looked real. They listened to the group's story and promised to figure it out. We'll send people there, one of the officers said, and we'll take you to the station to make a detailed report. When they were finally safe, Dan felt the tension ease. But something was gnawing at him inside. Why did this happen to them? Was it an accident, or were they just caught in the net of someone else's madness? A few weeks later, the police closed the case, saying they had found no evidence of crimes. The forest was declared a private territory, and access to it was limited. But neither Dan, Mary, nor Rachel returned to the area. Their lives went on, but every time they heard the creaking of branches or saw shadows in the forest, their thoughts returned to that night. Someone may have stayed in the forest, watching others who accidentally went where they shouldn't have.